Well, greetings, Team Healthy. I'm coming to you from a beautiful day here in Waco, Texas. I mean, we have a postcard day going on out there, and it's just stunningly beautiful and pleasant, crisp temperatures. I assume you know where you are, so I hope that, uh, that wherever you happen to be is a good day as well. Hey, I, I want to, before I go into the questions here, I want to just say something to you guys. And, and, and I think most of you know my heart by now, uh, particularly those of you who are regulars. Um, I really enjoy doing what I do, and, and I'm going to tell you why, just get, giving you a couple of illustrations. Uh, during the week, I received a, a message from a lady in Russia, and uh, at first, I, I saw the comments, and it was all written in this strange um, you know, uh, 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 terminology and all there. I didn't understand it at all, so I, what I did is I pasted it, and then I went to Google and let them uh, do the, uh, the translation for me. It's a lady in Russia saying that uh, she wanted to thank me from the bottom of her heart about the, uh, the information that she was receiving because she said, I don't get this kind of information where I live. And, and I, it's just so heartwarming when I hear something like that. So what I did is I actually uh, gave her my response and then I did a Google thing and I translated it into her Russian uh, language and sent it back to her. So it's, it's kind of heartwarming to be able to do that. And then I received another uh, from a person who was in uh, what she said was a remote part of Australia where uh, she had no uh, mental health uh, initiatives nearby that she could plug into, but that she plugs into uh, things like this on the internet uh, and uh, specifically to our channel. And, and it just reminds me, we're worldwide in our community here. And there are plenty of people and there are folks just right down the street from me that are hurting that tune in and there are people uh, wherever it is that you live. And the fact is, when I engage with you as Team Healthy, then when I see the, that the rest of you are saying words of goodness and encouragement and, and inspiration to one another and sharing your stories, I realize that's what we're here for. This is a virtual community and it's a place where we can uh, uh, lean into goodness and things that are um, wisest and best. So, hey, thanks for being Team Healthy. And thanks for letting me be part of your journey. Know that I take this seriously. And whenever I receive those kind comments, I mean, it just, it, it literally, it makes my day. Okay. It, it really does. Uh, so just know that. Now, today we're going to be talking about um, getting away from the narcissistic influence. And there's specifically one huge comment that many people can make as they are moving away from some of the strains that they've been under. And that is, this hurts. This is not easy. The, these individuals that I'm trying to extricate myself from don't uh, just say, well, you know, I wish you the best and I want to make sure that everything's okay. Instead, what they'll do is they can kick and scream and put shame on you and guilt and, and make you <laughs> just feel miserable as you're trying to make your healthy adjustments. And so I, today I want to go through these various questions with the understanding that says, yeah, I'm with you. There's a way to get through this. It, it, uh, we can't do it without a little amount of, uh, amount of pain that might go through it. But then I remind you that if you were to go through a physical surgery, let's say you had to have a knee surgery, for example, it, there's going to be some pain involved, but then there's going to be healing on the backside of it. And so don't let some of the the, the disparaging comments and the, the painful uh, aspects of it stop you in your efforts. So it's going to be so important for you to stay on your growth trajectory, uh, despite some of the hurdles that might be there along the way. So having said that, let's just dive right into our questions. By the way, those of you who are new, uh, put your questions in the comments section below and I'll pick up on them. And next week, we're going to come up with a whole new list. This allows me to know you in a more personal way. And so it allows me to address some things in ways that I might not naturally do so on a regular um, uh, video. So the first question, how do you deal with Pollyanna enablers who are close relatives? And then she goes on to say, my father was and is narcissistically abusive. And I've been estranged from him for over a year. I went no contact and I'm not willing to reconcile ever. I was my father's scapegoat child. My enabling family keeps trying to make me uh, reconcile despite my, me telling them I don't want to do so. So here you have a, a situation where uh, the dad has just been so awful and so mean and so difficult. It's like, I, I can't keep doing this anymore. And then uh, you have uh, members of the family who can actually say, well, yeah, I see it going on, but you got to stick around anyway. 
And so the question is, um, you know, how do I deal with these Pollyanna enablers? You know, they're, they're seeing this in, in real time, and yet they still back that other person up. Um, there, there's a point in real, uh, there's a point, a time in a point in time, easy for me to say a point in time where you can realize that there can actually become a culture of narcissism within certain family systems or uh, work settings, etc. And you can have the chief narcissist who says, Hey, look, I'm calling the shots around here and I don't care what it does to the rest of you people. I'm in charge and I'll make it miserable on you. If, if you want to go against me. And one person like this one asking the question might say, you know what, <laughs> that may be your standard operating procedure. You may have your rules of engagement for me, but you know what? I'm in a place in my life where I've decided you don't call the shots for me anymore. Plain and simple. And then you move away and that's what this person did. And yet you still have these people that will say, come on, it's not that bad. And they, they uh, just kind of play the role of apologist on behalf of that uh, primary narcissist. And see, my question is, what does that tell you about those individuals who are very willing to suppress their legitimate emotions and needs in service for that uh, manipulative, overwhelming narcissist? What does that tell you about them? And then my question is, as you make your own individual decision to move away from that, do you need the approval of individuals who are acting in illogic? I mean, because that's what we're dealing with. And um, part of the hurt, part of the struggle that you can have as you're trying to get away is the fact that there's so much illogic and nonsense that goes along with that. And so when you ask, how do you deal with these enablers? My first thing is number one, number one, number one, quit pleading your case. You, you don't have to explain yet again why it's legitimate for you to be you. You don't have to get their permission. You don't have to get their approval, particularly when they go back and say, yeah, but he was just in a bad mood. And you're thinking, yeah. And for the last 75 years, he's been in a bad mood. So what's new? Quit explaining and quit, uh, uh, quit trying to, uh, to plead your case when they say, well, I just don't understand why you're doing this. Inwardly, my reaction is I realize that. Or when they say, uh, you, you just can't do this. Emily, I'm thinking, well, actually I can. Or this, this is our family and you have to do this. And uh, Emily, I'm thinking, have to is not my motivator. I, I don't live in imperatives. I, I want to be a free person and I want to be around individuals who appreciate my freedom. And so this is what I refer to when you've heard me use a term like calm confidence. Once you know that you're making a wise decision, stay with it. That's the confidence part. And then the calm part is, and don't, uh, don't feel like you have to plead your case. Bottom line is you've probably done it all, oh, you know, three or four, I mean, literally three or four, 500 times and it hadn't worked yet. Move forward and move forward uh, knowing that you are comfortable with you, even if other individuals are not. Now I'm going to segue into the next question. And uh, this one gets a little bit more to the heart of the matter with what this person is dealing with. This person asked, Dr. C, can you talk more about the psychology of the flying monkey? How do they get so influenced by the narcissist? Okay, so you have somebody that's saying, I got to get away from this. It's painful. It hurts because I, I still have these individuals who are making excuses on the uh, uh, on behalf of the narcissist. And so the next question is, well, how do these people get that way in the first place? And you recall that when we talk about flying monkeys, it's an, uh, an analogy that uh, comes out of the, uh, the movie, The Wizard of Oz. Remember that the, the wicked witch of the West had these flying monkeys that would just do whatever she said they have to do and uh, would be available to do her bidding. That's what we're referring to. Narcissists like to gather flunkies. They like to gather people who will um, make arguments on their behalf. And so they're willing to do so. The flying monkey is someone that says, well, I'm going to go ahead and side with the person that has power. And they misunderstand what power is. Power in, uh, in the, the mind of the narcissist is I get to take my opinions and my preferences and manipulate individuals in any way that I want. And that means I'm a powerful person. Well, no, what that means is you're mean. 
Uh, power uh, comes from having inner character and inner integrity, and the narcissist does not have that. And the flying monkey is like, I'm willing to sidestep that. And so you then have to question, are, are the flying monkeys kind of semi-narcissists or narcissists in training, so to speak? And in fact, I, I did a, a video on this uh, over, over a year ago. Are flying monkeys uh, also narcissists or are they just cowards? And the answer is yes. Yes, uh, they're, they, there's a strong narcissistic bent that they have, but they point to the narcissist and say, well, that's the one over there. But no, you're you're making excuses for them. And so uh, with, with these flying monkeys, the reason they are a flying monkey is because they themselves have low levels of empathy. Uh, they have low emotional intelligence. I mean, when you take a look at what's going on and you can see the narcissist being, um, you know, just a, uh, you know, full of themselves and willing to run other individuals in the ground, willing to insult, willing to lie and cheat and manipulate and uh, cover up certain things. That's not emotional intelligence at all. Uh, these people, the flying monkeys, lack their own internal strength. Uh, they're willing to suppress the v validity of their needs. They live with fear. They live with shame. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, if they stand up and say, well, I don't agree with this, or I want to be a different person, the narcissist is able to pull them in line pretty quickly. We ought to be ashamed of that. You you need to uh, feel badly about who they are. So, yeah, I guess so. And so that, that's part of their scheme. And they have such low levels of insight that they don't make the necessary adjustments. And so uh, they defer to the narcissist because uh, common sense and all their emotional dysregulation has, uh, has just, um, just uh, consumed the, or the lack of common sense has just consumed them. So just know that there are times when if a person is willing to speak up on behalf of that narcissist and saying, I'm agreeing with that person. Okay. Well, then, <laughs> And once again, like that first question, I don't need your approval then, uh, because these are individuals who then want to turn to you and say, please suppress the validity of who you are, just like me. And please uh, go ahead and let yourself be uh, spoken to and treated in a very unworthy kind of way, just like me. Like, no, uh, I'm not going to play that game. But nonetheless, there are individuals who think, well, uh, that that power person uh, which is nothing more than just an element of evil. Uh, that, that's the one. Uh, th th those are the folks that have it all figured out. No, they don't. All right. Now the next question, and, and this is one, and you I know you're going to pick up on this very first sentence, and you can pretty much guess what I'm going to say to this one. How can I get my narcissistic husband to quit pursuing me? Okay. You know what my response is going to be? It's not your job to get someone, to make someone, say or do or think or feel or act in whatever way you want them to act. Uh, that person is a free agent. That person gets to be whatever they want to be. And uh, it's not, I don't say that saying, yeah, I think it's fine. It just simply is. Each person has the, uh, the privilege to choose from themselves. Okay. So I just had to start off with that. How can I get my narcissistic husband to quit pursuing me? And then in parentheses, this person says the divorce will be final next month. He puts on a radical show of selfless serving love that endures and tries so hard and waits for me. But I tried again with him and he crossed all of my boundaries and he belittles me and attempts uh, and, and attempted to control his living situation by not paying his rent and getting an eviction notice so that I would get him to, uh, to so that I would let him come back. Okay, this speaks of uh, the art of uh, the, the, the pitiable element of uh, manipulation on this person. Uh, this individual is dreadfully in search of narcissistic supply. And you've decided, I don't want to be your narcissistic supply. Now, he's acting as if uh, he's in great pain and travail, and I'm so sorry, and I promise I'll be better. And then you go on and describe that he's still in the high control mode, which tells me he's full of baloney. <laughs> I can say it a little bit more graphically, but I think you can kind of get my drift on that. No, uh, control is control. And if you try to put a red bow on it and, and uh, you know put it in a nice package, it's still control. So he's talking about how much I love you and uh, you know he's going to be selfless and serve you. And yet uh, there's a persuasion 
there's a, a, a coercion and insistence, then it says this guy doesn't get it. Um, in fact, if he did get it, then what he would say would be, you know, looking at the, um, uh, the history that we've had of discord and you're at the point where you say you don't want to be there anymore, which tells me that you're in great pain. First and foremost, if he's changed, uh, he would say, I, I honor that. I, I acknowledge that something dreadful has, has gone wrong. And the last thing I need to do is to try to talk you into coming back to something that you found to be so distasteful. And then he would wait. Patience. Uh, you've heard the saying, love is patient. And, uh, and so if he would be able to do that and say, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. And if there was a humility that was involved, then it'd be like, hmm, let's see how long that could last. By the way, I'm, I'm uh, working on a new uh, video that's going to be coming up in two, three weeks about, uh, you know, the, the seven changes that a person can make if they want to wipe out narcissism. So and uh, just uh, keep your eye out for that one. But instead, this person is uh, still doing the pleading. And then that, that one thing that he wound up not paying his own rent at the place where he's staying so that he could get evicted. And then he could come with all of his bags packed and, and stand at the front door of your house and say, oh, I love you so much that I didn't pay my rent so that I could come and live with you. So what he's saying then is, you see, I am so willing to be a manipulator to get you back that I'm willing to do that. And I'm so willing to suspend logic. And uh, I think that that will really impress you. Uh, because look, I didn't pay my rent. So <laughs> don't you think that's a good idea for you to uh, take me back in? And I'm thinking, do I have stupid <laughs> written right there on my forehead? And that's how these people can think. And I'm, I'm hoping that rather than you writhing in your pain and anguish and all of that can say, well, if nothing else, this illustrates why I'm in the position that I'm in. And so uh, control is control. And if they want to dress it up and try to make it look pretty while they're controlling you, it's like, it's only a matter of time before it's going to go back to that real ugly form of control. And I don't want to be around when that happens. So know what you're dealing with. And then you can't make him uh, be any, uh, any different, but at some point, you can, uh, in your mind, at least, you don't, uh, you don't have to say it to him over and over again. And in your mind, it's like, I, I'm, I'm finished offering explanations. I'm done. I'm going to move on. And when he says, well, why? I've already explained it. So I don't need to offer any more, uh, any more explanations because I'm going to get the same comeback, which says he doesn't get it anyway. It's his uh, effort to stay in control. And, uh, you know, just let it be. All right. Now, another question. And this kind of goes right along with all that we're saying here. Um, this person says, do narcissistic individuals see codependent individuals as icing on their narcissistic cake? And the answer is, how, how strongly can I say yes? It, it's a huge yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, narcissists look for codependent partners. Now, notice that I said partners. Narcissism in and of itself is, uh, is born out of uh, uh, dependency needs. And narcissists, most of them, especially the, you know, the big, mean, and tough bravado narcissists would say, I'm not dependent on anybody. And, and the answer is, oh, yes, you are. Uh, part of dependency means that you allow your mood and your sense of direction to be determined by outside sources. And narcissists, I mean, they're, they're reactors left and right. They have so much anger and so much bitterness and so much agitation and impatience. Well, I'm making the assumption that the reason is because you people out there, dependency, aren't giving me what I want. And, uh, and I'm going to continue to whine and moan and groan and kick and scream until I get you to make me feel good. That is the, the uh, consummate dependency. And then that, that uh, prefix co simply means with. They're looking for a partner. I want you to do this with me. And so narcissists already in their dependent mode are looking to you to make them feel good about who they are and to give them their supply. And so if they can just keep you in the game, it's like, well, I'm, I'm happy. And even if you uh, are a codependent, even in an argumentative kind of way, they argue with you, you argue back. Uh, they get mad at you. You get mad at them. They pout, you pout. 
Uh, they plead their case. You plead your case. They're defensive. You, you're defensive in reverse. Hey, you're playing the game. And as far as they're concerned, that invigorates them. And so do they look for individuals who uh, are willing to do that? The answer is yes. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage you to take that, uh, that little prefix co and uh, insert another prefix in, I in. I don't want to be codependent. I want to be independent. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you know, there, we have a, another word that's, that's called free. Freedom means I have the privilege to choose for myself who I'm going to be. And uh, even though they want to keep you involved in, you know, filtering everything through them, in other words, don't make your own separate decisions. Uh, the non-codependent person is going to say, well, I'm going to be independent in the sense that uh, I get to be who I am. In fact, it would be inappropriate for me to try to become somebody that I'm not. And I I'm confident enough that my independence, my freedom is going to lead me in a healthy and reliable and responsible way. If you'd like to join me, that would be absolutely wonderful, but I, I doubt that you will. And if that's the case, then I don't feel the need to go into that co-dependent dance with you. I, I, my, my internal peace is much more secure than the narcissist. So essential for you to see that. Okay. All right. We have another one. Um, and, and, and I, I get variations of this kind of question pretty often. Uh, this person says, Dr. C, is it possible for one person to be both covert and overt and uh, malignant at the same time? Um, and then this person says, my husband fits all three and, it se and seems to switch between them when it would suit him. Vile verbal abuse and then silence and physical repercussions, threats of death and such. Uh, and so the question is, uh, can you be covert, overt, malignant all at the same time? And the answer is, oh, yeah, it's called the chameleon effect. And, uh, uh, for, and the way I like to put it is think, think about how people use anger. We often think of individuals who are angry as screaming at the top of their lungs. OK, that's anger. But sometimes it can be like they'll have this uh, quiet contempt. That's anger. Sometimes they can react with annoyance. That's anger. Sometimes they can act with impatience. Sometimes it uh, prompts them to be critical. Sometimes they'll become passively aggressive. They'll be uh, quietly non-cooperative. Uh, and so anger can show up in so many different ways. In fact, uh, you know that I used to do anger workshops in my first session on my six-part uh, series on that. I would have all these checklists and uh, at the end, I'd over into the world of narcissism. There are so many ways that narcissism can play out. Uh, and which is why I, I have plenty of topics to talk about. Uh, and so just, just because we can say, well, there's a, there's covert narcissism, there's overt narcissism. It doesn't mean that one person has to pick. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, pick one to the exclusion of the other. It's like, I'll, I'll pick them all. And so sometimes it can be very loud and, and abrasive and overwhelming. Sometimes they can be quiet. Sometimes they can be mean spirited. Sometimes they can be indifferent. That's the chameleon effect. And there are many, many different ways that it can play out. So just know that uh, when, when they are shifting gears, what they're doing is they're thinking within themselves. Okay. I have various manipulative schemes that I'm trying to accomplish here and I'm trying to figure out which strategy is going to work best for me. And so that's what they're doing. And so know it for what it is. Know that you're dealing with a chameleon who's trying to figure out how to maintain their power over you. And, uh, and then what it means is, uh, the more they uh, switch from one thing to another, it says, well, then you've got somebody who's deeply committed to their own pathology. That's not someone that you want to take your cues from. Okay. And this is, this is another really interesting one. And this is from a caring mother. And, you know, one of the problems you can have is let's say you married into a situation and that person turned out to be highly narcissistic. And then one of the things that you can't completely do is protect your own kids from their influence. And that's where this is coming from. But this person says, my adult daughter, and I, I, I don't know how old, but I'm kind of guessing 25, 35, somewhere in that range. Uh, my adult daughter had, continu had continued to have lunch with my narcissistic ex, even though she would spend a day in bed with a migraine after each lunch date. 
At this last lunch date, she said she lost it with her father and released all of her pent up anger and frustration. And then it says, instead of a migraine, she said she said she slept like a baby that night. What uh, what would you call her type of experience? You may have heard the old saying, the body keeps score. So many times, and this is part of that hurt that you can experience when you're dealing with a narcissist and trying to get away. So many times you wind up suppressing, suppressing, suppressing your true self. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to poke the bear. I don't want to get them all riled up because you know how they are. And so in, in doing so, you can create an entire pattern of uh, suppressing to the point that it leads to all sorts of somatic kinds of responses. And it's, it's highly known that when you're under stress because you're holding in all of that uh, pain and frustration, that you're going to be prone towards things like a headache, like this uh, young lady did, or it could be that you'll just have uh, a basic sense of fatigue, or you may have grinding of the teeth. You can have insomnia. Uh, you can have, um, you know, all sorts of gastro issues, things like that. That's what we mean when we say the body keeps sore, uh, keeps score. We have a word for that. It's called somatization. And the uh, soma is a, uh, the Greek word for body. It, 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 your emotions take themselves out on the body. So in this case, this daughter, this adult daughter, rather than thinking, you know, I'm just going to store it all up on the inside. I'm going to be a good trooper and I'm going to have that conversation with my narcissistic dad. And I'm just going to let him feel like he's in total charge of me. This time that person said, you know what? No, it, it's, it's eating me from the inside out. And she just let it all out. Uh, and instead of uh, coming home thinking, well, I, I regret what I said it's, it, at some point, it's like, I've been, I've been wanting to say that for years and it finally came out. And whether the narcissist is going to make any difference uh, change or not, that's not my point. Finally, I get to say, this is the real me. And part of you getting out of your trap that uh, the narcissist has put you inside, uh, at some point it's like, um, there's not, a, there's not a lock on my side of this door. I'm going to open up my side of the door and I'm walking out and I'm not going to you know, look back. I'm going to just keep moving. And at some point it's, it's reasonable for you to say, uh, this has become too much and I'm going to openly declare, uh, my intentions. And that's what that young lady did. And in doing so, I'm sure the narcissist thought, well, you can't do this. And my response is I just did keep moving. And, and so at some point, uh, you, you remind yourself, I'm responsible for me being a healthy person. I hope that that decision has positive repercussions for other individuals. If it doesn't, perhaps that's because that other individual has so much negativity that they're bound by that I'm not able to do anything about it. Uh, I'm only responsible for me. I want my, my decisions to uh, bode well for other individuals when not. I still need to stay true to who I am. I'm not very good trying to pretend that I'm somebody that I'm not, especially when it's just causing all of this uh, somatic kind of reaction. Okay. All right. Now this next one, and this hurts me when I, when I have these kind of questions, um, because it, it just, I just feel like as I was reading this, that this is a person who's uh, kind of lost herself. Uh, this individual says, is the desire to, to perform cruel pranks, and then in parentheses, and a desire for sexual bondage for that matter, is that correlated to narcissism? How common is it to see this characteristic in a narcissistic person? Or is it not necessarily a narcissistic trait, but maybe just a personal quirk? When I called him out, he tried to make me feel guilty for judging him. Okay, to me, you're you're asking such a basic question. Uh, notice the use of two different words here. Um, the word cruel is the desire to perform cruel pranks. And then the word bondage. Um, when they uh, engage sexually, he wants it to be a bondage thing. In other words, you are totally underneath my dominance. Um, is that correlated to narcissism? And the answer is that's narcissism with a capital N, all caps. Of course it is. And, and the fact that this individual asked, well, is this kind of common 
for these people to do that. And not everybody goes into sexual bondage if they have narcissistic traits, but if they want to bind you with anything, then what they're saying is I own you and I don't want you to be free. I don't want you to be natural. I want you to come under my uh, total power. That's no way to live. And then uh, this is the part that makes me feel sad when she asked, well, do you think maybe just, it's just maybe a quirk. It makes me think, okay, is your standard so low that, uh, that you can't see what's going on? What else have you dealt with in your past that would prompt you to think this way? And typically when somebody is in a place where they have been so, um, used and manipulated sexually and then other kind of ways, it's got where that person more or less implies I own you and uh, I get to do whatever I want to gain my pleasures from you. And if a person says, well, I guess I'll go along. Maybe this is just kind of a quirk. That tells me that you probably have a history where you were not allowed to think independently on your own. And so I'm glad, I'm, I'm super glad that you wrote this question in and that you're asking the question. And I'm hoping that you can, uh, uh, can remind yourself, you have no requirement whatsoever to come under someone else's bondage. And if there's cruelty, we have a different word for that. It's, it's called abuse. You are being abused. And then we have another term, it's called trauma bonding. When you stay stuck with that person, it implies that they have so messed with your head that they've taken away your sense of logic and reason. And it's time for you to claim that back. Now, my guess is you'll probably need some help in, uh, in doing this because it sounds as though this individual has a, a tight grip on you. And if it means that you need to go to either to a women's shelter or preferably to, uh, or not preferably because they do good work there. I, I did a lot of volunteer work when I lived in Dallas at a women's shelter. Uh, or uh, if it's uh, through therapy or recovery groups, please, please uh, avail yourself to that. That's why, you know, when I tell folks I'm sponsored by uh, the people at BetterHelp, the reason I, they're my uh, primary sponsor is because uh, I believe in it. And, and I really think you need to go get that help. So make sure that you're looking not only at this relationship, but what your vulnerabilities are from the past that prompted you to continue on in this way. You deserve so much better. No cruelty, no bondage, no domination. You don't need that. You need to be independently you. And I can't say that strongly enough. I hope you hear my heart on that. Okay. Now, um, next question. And this goes back to, I'm guessing that there has been some accusation that goes along with this as part of the pain of breaking away. This person says, Dr. C, do you think that you could, uh, could you take a moment to explain the difference between judgment, uh, excuse me, justice and vengeance. I would love to hear your opinion on this. Okay. When a person says, um, I don't like what you've done and I'm seeking vengeance, what they're doing is they're at least claiming to want to right a wrong, but in doing so, they're very willing to make the other person uh, suffer great pain and loss in the process. Now, a person who's seeking justice also is wanting to correct uh, rights uh, or wanting to cor correct, correct wrongs and turn them into right while illustrating that there's a much better way than being wrong. The vengeful person is saying, I want to uh, explain to you why I hate your mistreatment as I'm mistreating you. <laughs> In other words, they become just like the one that they're complaining about. The justice person says, well, I don't want to be mistreated. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm so devoted to that, that I want to stay uh, within the parameters of, of respect and honor and civility. And that's what I'm going to do. And so there still are consequences when you seek justice. There can be stipulations and boundaries and firmness. But I have no need to uh, 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 grind another individual in the ground while I'm in the process of that. So to me, that's the distinction there. Uh, are you going to go with, uh, you know, there's the old proverb that says, don't exchange evil for evil. I don't want to respond to your evil with my own version of evil. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to respond to your evil with my decency, even as I refute what you're doing to me. Okay. All right. Um, is it, this is another one that uh, I'm hoping you're going to pick up on my um, predictable reply here. Uh, is it possible to continue in a relationship with a gaslighter? 
Is there a word in that question that stands out to you? Is it possible to continue in a relationship with a gaslighter? The word I'm focused on is relationship. It's not a relationship. It's a transaction. When someone comes along and says, I'm willing to play you. I'm, I'm willing to manipulate you. I'm willing to, when we talk about gaslighting, it's like, I, I want to create confusion in you so that I can main, can maintain my control and get you to do my bidding. That means that you're being played. You're a transaction. You're an asset. You're a tool. You're a toy to, to be used or played with. And so right there, is it possible to continue in a relationship with a gaslighter? Well, it's not a relationship to begin with. Or can it be dangerous? Yes. The fact that you're asking the question tells me that deep down, you know that there's danger involved or you wouldn't have asked the question in the first place. Listen to what your heart is trying to tell you. And then this person goes on to say, now that I realize that he is a gaslighter, May it help? Uh, may it help me to not suffer from uh, so much from his tricks? In other words, once I can see it, do you think that's going to begin uh, be the beginning point for me getting away? Yes, yes, you're seeing it. Uh, or is it better to just run away? If you have a person who is willing to play these manipulative games with you over and over and you see it, that's wonderful. And, and sure enough, you, know, you can uh, learn to not necessarily give the predictable responses. My guess, though, is that uh, if you've been playing along with this for this long, he's probably going to just keep coming back at you. And it, it can be painful for you to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm growing and I'm learning. I need to get away from this. But if this is something that's been longstanding, if you have the resolve, but he does not, and you're hoping that he'll change based on just what you do, I mean, good for you that you're looking at this, but he has to have that same conviction on the inside of himself. And he has to have that sense that says, who I am is not working. I don't like who I am. I don't like being a manipulator of persons. I don't like being somebody that holds individuals under tight control and I try to keep them in prison through confusion. Uh, my guess is uh, he's not thinking that way. You are. And so just the fact that you can change doesn't mean that he's going to. Uh, you have to have both sides of the equation in accord for this to happen. So my guess is now that you see it, you're, you're not going to be able to unsee it. OK, so stick with your resolve. And the fact that you're asking these questions says, I know there's something dreadfully wrong here. And then give yourself permission to say, I don't need his permission to be me. Uh, I'm going to take my own initiatives. Uh, I have a good mind. I'm going to use it. And if he says I don't have a good mind, that's the gaslighting all over again, because yes, I do. And I'm going to go ahead and live inside of that. Uh, or uh, to put it another way, I am no longer willing to play the role of the dupe. Not my title anymore. All right. Um, this is another one. And this is part of the pain that you can have as you uh, try to break away. Uh, this person asked the question, from your professional experience, what can you say to survivors who are stuck in the blame cycle after leaving, trying to figure out if they're the ones who are narcissistic? By reacting poorly in our reaction with some mean responses, how do we know we're not the ones lacking insight and being mean and blaming someone else for our problem? Okay, first of all, and you've heard me say this before, and many of you have picked up on this and asked it of one another. If you're asking this question, that's a good, that's a good sign. Uh, so the fact that you're saying, I don't want to do this anymore. Am I the narcissist? Well, narcissists tend not to ask that question. And so uh, the, uh, give yourself credit for saying, I want to make some adjustments. Now, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a necessary awareness that this uh, question brings out. And that is, if you are wanting to be a healthy person, but if you're uh, exposed in an ongoing way to someone who's committed to the narcissistic pattern, there's a high probability, when I say high, 99%, that you yourself are going to respond with their ingredients leading the way. In other words, if they become mean, you can sometimes become mean. If they become argumentative, you become argumentative. That's that codependent dance I was talking about a few minutes ago. If they become uh, insistent, you become insistent. If they become stubborn, you become stubborn. And so you can think, well, am I the narcissist? Well, what's happened is that narcissist has gotten inside your head and you're responding in ways that uh, uh, mimic or mirror that person. So my question is, um, uh, when you ask, how can you, um, if, if you're stuck in the blame cycle toward yourself, 
I'm hoping you can remind yourself, well, the way I get out of that blame cycle is I remind myself I can do better. I, I, I tell folks constantly, uh, you can tell more about a person's character, not by the mistakes they make, but by the way they respond to the mistakes. The narcissist wants to point to your mistakes and say, see, you're nothing but a troubled person. And there's the evidence right there. The healthy person says, I see what the evidence says, and I'm going to do something about it. It doesn't mean that you're going to have an absence of mistakes or miscalculations, but it does mean that each time that you recognize what's going on, you're going into your place of growth. The narcissist wants to remind you, you can't do that. That's not something that you know, you're capable of, which is their way of saying, I need you desperately to be my supply, going back to that. And I'm hoping that you can decide, you know, I'm not going to just make external adjustments. I'm going to make internal adjustments. And it's going to start with me trusting myself, me believing in my own goodness, me believing in uh, the necessity of internal peace and internal calmness. That's who I am. And if it means that I have to extricate myself from a person who's going in the opposite direction, I'm willing to go in that place. It's so important for you to take charge of who you are, as opposed to handing over the reins to someone who clearly uh, doesn't have your best interest in heart. All right. Now, uh, this next one, and, and this is one where you can just feel the anxiety oozing from uh, the question. This person says, how do I get over the intense phobia? of holding a boundary with a narcissist? What are some methods? Meditation, rehearsal, and others. Um, and good for you that you're wanting to, uh, to, uh, to set boundaries. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when they try to be assertive and have their boundaries is they think, well, for it to work, I have to have their uh, concurrence. I have to have their uh, coordination. So I'm going to say, this is what I believe is best. And I want them to say, well, okay, since you put it that way. Uh, it's, narcissists aren't concerned with figuring out how to coordinate with you. Let's keep that in mind. For boundaries to be healthy boundaries doesn't mean that you have to have their concurrence. Boundaries means that you have a definition of who you are. And so if a narcissist comes along and says, let me give you my definition of who you need to be. And it means that you do A, B, and C. And then if you decide, well, upon further review, that's not how I define me. I, I define me with X, Y, and Z. And the narcissist says, I don't like that. Then in boundaries, it's like, yes, I'm very aware that you don't like that. And, and it's so distasteful to me. I'm going to go ahead and stay with X, Y, and Z anyway. And you proceed. And when they say, get back over here and do what I tell you to do, uh, you don't have to have their uh, permission. You don't have to have their uh, um, endorsement. You can say, well, I, I realize that's something that you are struggling with, but I'm going to let you struggle. I need to go ahead and stay true to me. That's what we mean when we talk about boundaries. And part of it means that when you say you have a phobia for that, you're going to need to release that narcissist from understanding you. Now, because I'm assuming that there's such a tension that goes along with this, uh, that tells me that you've probably been isolated uh, and that narcissist has kind of taken over, I would strongly encourage you to, uh, to talk about your plight with trusted individuals, whether it's a, a family member or a friend. Again, we go back to this is part of the need for therapy or support groups or uh, um, uh, places like that that can help you uh, make sure that you don't keep this uh, a private initiative. Uh, there's strength in numbers. And if you find other individuals like we have here on Team Health, it says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going in the same direction. I'd like to assist you in finding healthiness, then go there and, uh, and allow yourself to be assisted. Okay, one last question. I'm going to make this kind of quick. Um, Dr. C, how did I ever, uh, how did I never see these games that my narcissistic husband played 30 years, uh, uh, for, for 30 years? Sadly, I lost time with uh, much of my family. It, it's natural when you're trying to break away to wallow in the pain of regret and think, you know, <sighs> here I am at this stage in my life. Now I finally see it, but I feel like I've lost so many decades now. And I'm not going to say that you shouldn't feel regret because sometimes you do. I, when people say, well, I have no regrets. Well, sometimes I do. And sometimes you do. 
And it's good to have that if it can lead in a healthy direction. The, the question is, are you listening to what the regret says? Uh, okay, I can't take away those 30 years that she's talking about. What I can do is I can just say today's Wednesday and beginning today on Wednesday, I have a different direction I'm going in. Tomorrow on Thursday, I'll uh, reconsider and I'll start all over again. And you do it on a day-by-day -day basis until it becomes more and more habitual and it becomes baked into your character. And so allow yourself to feel the pain, but don't be dominated by the pain. Listen to what it's telling you and then make your adjustments accordingly. All right, Team Healthy, so many good questions and uh, plenty more that, uh, that you've sent in. Please uh, send your questions in. I can't promise I'll be able to respond to all of them, but I, I read through them, every one, and, uh, and I so appreciate you. Uh, in your efforts to try to make your healthy adjustments. Know again that I appreciate you letting me be on the trip with you. And I, I want absolutely nothing but the best for you. Um, consider yourselves to be emiss emissaries of who we are here on Team Healthy. And wherever you have your sphere of influence, give them the very best that you have to offer. All right, guys. See you same time, same station next week. I, I am going to be on it here in America uh, next Wednesday is the day before Thanksgiving, but I'm going to be uh, tuned in with you and we'll, uh, we'll pick up and carry on from there. Bye.